to give us a bit of a negative sort of like attention which is not right in many in many ways i'm not saying negativity doesn't exist but it does in every society and every faith in the world so and um, this is just a short presentation and it's just an inshallah to show about equality in islam so i'm going to start with the first slide so the theme this year on International Women's Day is an equal world is an enabled world. And International Women's Day is a global day celebrating the social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women while also marking the call to action for accelerating gender equality. So what does Islam say about women and did Allah give equality to, to us, as some of it's gone missing, it's meant to be to women. When I put this presentation on here, it was very different to my computer and it wouldn't work, so please bear with me. So there's just one of the, one, a picture of what a lot of us um, like to say as ladies, that Islam has raised the status of women from below the earth to, to so high that paradise lies at our feet. And I will explain that a little bit further on. So just a point that nowhere does the Quran say that one gender is superior to another. On the verse of the Quran, O oh humankind, we created you from a male and female and made you into nations and tribes so that you may come to know one another. Truly the most honoured of of you in God's sight is the greatest of you in piety. God is all-knowing, all-aware. So we're just going to go into a short section of the history of the earliest Muslim women and their equality because they were very equal at the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And the women companions, they were contemporaries of their, of their time and they were honoured. Their achievements and influence were momentous in that period in the history of Islam. These women were found in business, politics, education, Islamic jurisprudence, Sharia, agriculture, medicine, nursing, the arts, trade and commerce. 
There was no sphere that did not benefit from their intellect, wisdom, gentle, but firm, firm characters. And just to give you another sort of like understanding of how important the women were in Islam, that there is no less than 8,000 biological accounts documented of female scholars up until the 12th century. And Imam Dabahabi, if I've said it wrong, please forgive me, noted that amongst the female narrators of the Hadith, there was none to be found to be fabricated. The women's scholarly integrity and independence were unimpeachable. Yeah, so you can see that they weren't told to go away, sit down, stay in the kitchen, make food, <laughs> brothers, you know. Sorry, it wasn't directly I aimed because I know not all of you are like that. <laughs> it's a smile. Yeah. <laughs> so to give an example, a few examples of these earliest Muslim women, I'm going to mention Prophet Muhammad, he's upon him, first wife, Khadija. Khadija was a successful and esteemed businesswoman, and she was the first Muslim woman at that time. Khadija was born to a father who was a successful merchant of the Quraysh time in Mecca. She inherited her father's skills and took over his businesses when he died trading goods through commerce in Mecca, Syria, and Yemen. Can I just point out, and during that time as well, that Khadija's, that business that she inherited was the largest trading business at that time. So you can imagine she'd had to be pretty savvy, pretty level-headed to be able to, it was a male-dominated world as well. She, he rocks. Yeah. <laughs> and just to point out that before his prophethood, Muhammad went to work for her. He didn't say to her, you've got to stop working now, we're married, we're going to take over the business. He actually carried on working for her, he supported her, he did many of her transit, he did many of her trade journeys because of his honest because of how honest and trustworthy that he was. So Muslim women and politics. But Islam has extended rights to women that the West did not provide until the 18th, 19th centuries. The right to vote for women is as old as the religion of Islam itself. Islamic historical records indicate women's active right to vote and participate in political decision-making process have been around for more than 1,400 years. Islam protects a woman's right to political participation, but it also provides the right to be nominated to a political position. And I'm just gonna go back to the 18th and 19th centuries, and I'm gonna use Manchester as an example because these women deserve to be mentioned. I'm only gonna mention two. Lydia Becker, has you heard of her? Lydia Becker was before Emmeline Pankhurst. She was born in Cooper Street in Manchester in 1827, in the city centre near Cooper Street Police Station, the old one. She was an amateur scientist. She loved nature, and especially plants. She often wrote to Charles Darwin, and she used to send samples of the plants in Manchester to get his feedback. And then she used to write essays and used to put them out into journals. She was quite well known at the time in Manchester and she did win a gold award. She published a book, Botany for Novices. In 1867 she organised the very first meeting in Manchester to campaign for women's votes. 1868 she was a leading organiser for the National Society for Women's Suffrages at the Free Trade Hall, which is still standing in Manchester, yeah? And around that time there was a woman called Lady Maxwell and she was accidentally put on the voting register. 
So Lydia actually took her to the polling station because she fell already down. And the men tried to say that she couldn't vote. But Lydia enforced her right to vote because she was on the register because she was on the register to vote. So she was allowed to vote, they couldn't say no. And it was that example that Lydia then took to voting stations and demanded the right to vote for women. And she used it to launch a very successful campaign. And when Emmeline Pankhurst was 15, she met Lydia, yeah? And Lydia started working with her and encouraged her to be involved in the, in the women's suffrages in 1880 in Manchester. And obviously you know the history of the Pankhurst Centre and that was another woman who rocked in Manchester at the time. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so... She was she, Lydia's teacher. She was Lydia was her teacher, so she was very inspired by her. So I never knew about Lydia until I started doing this presentation, and I stumbled across it by accident. So, um, so I thought should they deserve a mention because you know they fought for the women's rights in Manchester, in Manchester, and for the whole of England. I'm now going to mention Al Shifa bint Abdullah. Al Shifa was a woman of intelligence and was highly respected at her time for her learning and wisdom. When she came into Islam, she was a nurse, and that's where she got the name from, Al Shifa. Her real name was Layla. But they gave her that name because of her, because she, her ability to heal. She was also one of the first earliest women who had learned to read and write. And is considered as one of the first teachers in Islam. She actually taught other women to read and write. And her role was very, very important at the start of Islam because of her ability to read and write. Because a lot of the, the, the male scholars, a lot of the Sahaba, used to go to her to ask for, a, for, a, for advice to help them write registrations. And so she was very important. She had vast knowledge on Islam and Islamic jurisprudence. She narrated many hadiths and was an advisor to the second Caliph Umar. So she, again, she did deserve a mention because. I don't think she gets mentioned enough, personally. Has anybody ever heard of her before? No. So a Muslim woman has a right to education and it's equal to that of a man. Because the first word revealed in the Quran was read. And the pursuit of knowledge and education is equal for men and women in Islam. The Quran says that is a duty for every Muslim. The Prophet, peace be upon him, was very vocal in emphasizing education for every Muslim, both female and male. And some of the earliest women were great scholars on narrating and teaching hadith and also the Quran. So you all know about Aisha? Yeah. <laughs> She was the wife of Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, and an extremely intelligent scholar of Islam. She is credited with narrating more than 2,000 hadith. I think it's 2,200, somewhere around there. She is noted for her sharp intelligence, love of learning, and impeccable judgment. Aisha was very active in teaching Islam to both men and women. Many prominent companions of the Prophet came to her today to gain understanding of the rulings in the faith because of her intelligence and mastery of jurisprudence. She clarified matters of inheritance that deeply dealt with mathematics and she was also highly knowledgeable in medicine, poetry and history. All these women were encouraged <coughs> to, to have these roles. They were equal with a lot of the brothers that was around at the time as well, because Faisal was looking a bit 
Now for this one, you have to forgive me because on my computer, I just needed to press that picture and the video would come on. So I just need to do this. This is a very short video. The first university in the world. Was the founder and patron of the world's first university in the history of mankind. The institution is commonly known as the University of Cairo Medina. It is in Fez, Morocco. Today, its talent continues to promote learning and education. It was over a thousand years ago, in the ninth century, that the concept of institutionalized academic learning and research was born. From the foundation of her very first brick, Fatima Fikhri resolved to observe the ritual class daily for as long as the building was under construction. A wealthy widow, Fatima Fikhri invested all of her inheritance towards financing what eventually became the Qayyarawiyyin Mosque and later on University the world's first degree granting institution of higher learning. And I'm sure you've all heard of the Abdullah Quilliam <coughs> Mosque in Liverpool. There was many influential women around the Quilliam Foundation at that time when it was first set up in I think 1889. They played a major contribution to the community and they were, they were leaders in spreading Islam basically and teaching the community about Islam and in welcoming them in. They wrote for mosque, mosque publications, organised events, gave talks on women's rights in Islam, challenged the patriarchal society of the Victorians, were active in literature, maths, science, politics, and, they also, and the women also ran a home for the destitute children in 1897, which took them in, they cared for them and looked after them. 
And I'm going to mention a few of those women. Lady Evelyn Zena <coughs> was a British aristocrat. And she was one of the first European women to perform Hajj on her own when she went in a car. <laughs> so, you know, she sort of like broke it. You saw this, when you look at Saudi, what they had to fight for for the women to drive. A woman from Britain. Well done. <laughs> Madam Teresa Griffin Biella. She was a news correspondent for Liverpool Mosque in 1894. And she had her resume for political events published in Islamic journals. Mrs. Zabeda Ali Akbar had the honour to be presented to the Queen in 1895. Miss Tabor Bill Graham was the first, she passed the first exam in the arts at the Madrasa University. And Jessie Amina Davidson was also a published lady in Islamic Review in, in 1926. So some of the women you may not have heard from. Does any of you know? I'm sure you know some of these. <laughs> yeah, yeah especially you know Nadia from the Great British Bake Off. Nadia? So the UK's first Muslim woman in the White House back in 2009. Egyptian-born, advisor holds her title as a renowned speaker and writer, objective and credible in her speech and actions. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce that first name. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> a journalist, politician and a human rights activist. She became the first Arab woman and the second Muslim woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize. And obviously, you know Nadia, she was a great British bake off, got everybody <coughs> baking, everybody started bringing cakes to work and gifts, and people set up their own little cake businesses as well. So, yeah, so she's, you know, she's done very well. Mashallah, I'm just going to go through a few things. So the rights of women in Islam, the reason I'm putting this in is because some people think that we're not entitled to, and we, and we do have equal rights here. The right to inheritance. There is a slight difference with the right to inheritance, but we are allowed to inherit money. And we do not get the same share as a man. It is less, because the reason being, that inheritance is ours, we're keeping it. <laughs> the, the, the husband's inheritance, you're spending it on us as well. <laughs> so technically, we get it all. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> and it's to give a realistic, to, to look at it realistically, it's to give a balance. Because the man does, the, the husband does have a lot of pressure in providing everything for the wife, the home, the children. So that's why you, you get, but we know we still get it, so. <laughs> And they do work hard, mashallah, they do. And she can work, and again, her earnings are hers if she's married. Yeah. <laughs> you, you sat there now thinking, hey, it's not a bit of a fair, unfair deal, this, isn't it? <laughs> I'm listening, girl. <laughs> she does have a right to choose her, her own husband. <coughs> And if she does not give consent to it, the marriage is actually invalid if she's forced, yeah? So we, we do have that right. And she's also allowed to ask for a divorce, but there is specific, what's the word I'm looking for? Reasons, Reasons. why she can, ask, she can ask. And that can be if she's suffering physical, financial, or emotional harm from the, hus from the husband. Any violence in the marriage is condemned by Islam. She can go and seek a divorce if she's, if, you know, if she's suffering that. There are, obviously, adultery. If he's not praying, if he's going out drinking, he's not gambling, if he's not looking after her, he's, he's not looking after the children. You know, she, she can go and seek advice. Obviously, they, there is a process that they have to follow. 
she has to be spoken to, he has to be spoken to, they get together, there's mediation, they have to work at it, help will be offered if help is needed, because they'll try everything to save the marriage first, but she still has the right to walk away if she wants to, yeah? Usually it's the last one. So the status of a woman in Islam, I'm not going to go too, too much into this section, but I'm going to cover on some of the, two of the pictures here, like a man came to Allah's Apostle and said, oh Allah's Apostle, who is more entitled to be treated with the best companionship by me? The Prophet said, your mother. The man said, who is next? The Prophet said, your mother. The man further said, who is next? The Prophet said, your mother. The man asked for the fourth time, who is next? The Prophet said, your father. Now this was just to give us the status of how important a mother actually is for the children, for the home, in how she, she's um, raising her family. And in a time where it's cool to be a working mother, I do think that housewives and those mothers who choose to stay at home should be celebrated far more than they actually are. Because I think there's a lot more pressure put on Muslim women, um, put on women, not just Muslim women, but the younger generation. God, I feel old now, I've just said that, but I don't, but you, I'm not as changed, I'm only 48, but. Um, she should be celebrated. The work of a mother is vast, and it is vast, and running a home, how, how we multitask everything, how we're being a wife as well, because trying to be a wife is, you know, slap on a bit of makeup, give a wink when we need to, yeah? <laughs> I have to crack it, um, drop a joke. The next one is a daughter. Again, it shows the importance of the female, and lucky is a woman whose first child is a daughter. And I think that's quite beautiful, even though my mum had two boys before me. Still got me, yeah? And if you have a daughter, and you grow her educator, love her with full care, then Allah will grant you Jannah for sure. So again, it goes to show how precious females are, how um, we should be looked after, and we, sh we should. And it's uh, a lot of women can stand up for themselves. As you can see, there's, there's lots of strong women, even going to mention literally, there are a lot of women here who teach the Quran, who does Islamic studies, who do, who do circles. They're very, very active. This, in fact, in most mosques that I go to, the, the women are more active than the men, but we still should be in some. Unfortunately, there's still a world where it's male dominated. But as you can see throughout Islam, and inshallah I've shown it to everybody, that women have always been active. We have been very strong characters. We can educate, we can be in politics. We have the equal right to work. We have the equal right to be in a society which appreciates us. We don't have to just stay at home. You know, we're intelligent, we're clever, we're warm, we're embracing. And that's it really, that's all I can, I'm going to say at the moment. So thank you very much. I hope you learned something. And um, forgive me my, 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 my uh, Mancunian twang on the Arabic. And, but, you know, I tried. <laughs> So what we're going to do now, we've got two interactive sessions. I'm going to pull this forward. If anybody wants to come up and do the nice thing of writing on the board, come on, don't be afraid. What I'm going to be going to do, we're going to have a discussion. And it'd be nice if some of our guests would like to speak about the negative, any negative things that you hear about Muslim women, because it's out there in the media. Oh, you the gentleman, yeah? Anything you want to know, here's your chance. 
and we're going to try and yeah, do you want to? <coughs> and we'll try our hardest to answer it. Not just me. There's other people here who will be able to answer it. I would say form a circle, but I don't think we can. So we'll just do it from here. Yeah. So here's your chance. Ask away. Don't be shy. <laughs> Am I writing the questions? Yeah, you can write the notes or write the question. Any questions? Well, I didn't come here to say about negative things at all. No, but it's a challenge to try and challenge some of the media, sort of. Oh, um, see what you mean. Um, anything you want to know about Muslim women, basically. Well, I've heard about the harshest things that have been said recently about women who cover their faces completely. It's not something I have strong views on, but, you know, it's something that the media often takes up on, and of course, the Prime Minister shamefully. Yeah. Um, uh, spoke on that, and um, you know, I do feel as though it's a woman's right to dress how they feel comfortable. Yeah. Definitely, Sister Saina, behind you, do you know? Do you want to add anything to that? Did you wear the car? I want to say that this Nicole with this new coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> because that's where I put all my troubles and it's quite frustrating that I can't do that so yeah it will put an extra pressure and unhappiness on me and I have to wait till you know till afterwards but um but yes yeah, so we do call it a holiday so may I ask do, do people pray privately in their own home when they're menstruating we can make do I like we would pray just now, yeah, like walking down the street or just sat down. But the actual ritual prayer, we mm -hmm. can't, we can't pray, we can't pray that way. Can you just move around? Yeah. It's yeah. a break for a while. It's a break, yeah. They take a break. Yeah, yeah. I think if you allow me to add my own interpretation yeah. to the matter, is that the woman, Allah has, that's one of the blessings that Allah has given the woman. Because of her responsibilities and her duties, obviously the non-ending list of being a mother, a wife, and all that. So it's a kind of break. break. It's given to the woman so she can like recharge and also that there is no pressure on her as a man because the men are physically more powerful than the women. Unless so they are the flute. 
know, but physically we're talking. So the woman, because of all the other yeah. tasks she's given that, because obviously when the, the body it bleeds, obviously there is a bit of, uh, you know, it takes from, from the strength from the woman. So obviously with that, that, there is no pressure on the woman to, to balance that on top of all her, all her other duties. So it gives her that break that while you are carrying on with the other tasks, you can still have a rest mm. and it's not support, it's not something that we have to pay back, thank God. And that's a, a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mm. that, you know, you are exempt and once you go back and you are pure, you know, after a number of days, then you just get back to your normal life. And, yeah. you know, that's something, to be honest, when you look at it deeply, it's something that's really, really good for the woman. And you, you have a, a break with her in Ramadan or any other time of the rest of the 12 months. And you are not having that pressure to pay it back. So you just take it as a rest and resume. That's my personal you see that interpretation. From Allah there? Yeah. <laughs> I just, I, I really appreciate the answer. I've got a second question. Uh, what responsibilities does a wife. <laughs> have to fulfill for her husband and what responsibilities does the husband have to fulfill for his wife to enable her to fulfill those responsibilities so it's just a very fine-tuned area of not bringing us flowers and chocolates when you've done something wrong is, is, is not the right way to go <laughs> Responsibility is upon the husband to provide something for the wife to enable her to fulfill the responsibility. Well, obviously, apart from the financial, you're providing the home, the clothes, the food, everything, holidays, the mobile phones, handbags used, this. Yeah. <laughs> um, obviously, and that's a fact. It's a right? partnership. That's not even a joke, that's absolute fact. Right, yeah, I know, that's why he has to, And if she has a servant, he has to provide for the servant as yeah. well. Yeah. Even if, even if, before she didn't have a servant, before marriage, if she brings a servant into the household, he has to provide for one servant. Some scholars argue for the second servant as well, but some most say no. I'm going to stand here and be honest, because I'm a woman who runs her own home. Yeah? <laughs> Just me. Yeah. If somebody else would like a chance, but my understanding, yeah, not being in the situation is basically she's protecting her husband's home. Yeah, she's not to put him down, not to go talking and bad mouthing about him if he had an argument, you don't put it on Facebook. Yeah, every five minutes. His honour, his integrity. Um, <coughs> basically, I, I'm one of those, if, if you're a housewife, please, if you're a feminist, don't jump on me. Yeah, if a man is going out working all day, I do believe that he's got a right to come home and have a meal on the table. That's me, she's gonna cook anyway. Do you know it's Please his... don't jump on me. Yeah, I'm just saying, if he's going out working all day, yeah, and you're at home, you're raising your family, your children, you're gonna be cooking for your children anyway. You're gonna be cooking that meal. You know it's his responsibility. But he's providing it. But the other point is, she doesn't always have to do it. And when you look at the example of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he cooks, he cleans, he sold socks. So he doesn't have to sit there and just demand everything. It's a partnership. Yeah, she's doing her role. She's being a good wife. She's raising the children. But again, if you look at, again, suppose it comes upon the situation, is she also going out to work? Mm. Yeah? Mm. yeah? So you share the responsibility. But he's got to protect her honour as well. Well, uh, he's got the right to do it by saying that he's probably not going to do those things. But how, how do people generally feel then it, as often happens now a man might not have a job and the woman who seems to be keeping the family uh, close is, I hope there isn't a feeling of shame because the economics of the country are so hard at the yeah. moment. Does anybody want to that one? Do men feel shame if a woman's working? There's a very very good example in the, the scholarship uh, of of Islam of this, where um, this was the uh, one of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm sure one of the sisters can correct me if I'm wrong, Sister Zaina, uh, where she she asked if she could give zakat to her husband, she could give charity to her husband so that he could pay for their upkeep. 
because he was in such dire uh, financial constraints, she asked if, if that was permissible, and the answer was yes. But she could not ask him for zakat. So a woman cannot ask her husband for zakat because if she is asking, then he is not providing her as his wife. Yeah, right. So the other is impermissible, but the other way around it is permissible. But he has, he has. The understanding is that kind of he's getting charity because he's in such a bad financial strait. Anybody else? of women that a lot of the language that's used is kind of um, is more kind of towards protecting especially like for example if a father was telling a story to his daughter it would it uses language that's very protective of women in that way that um, you know it doesn't mention things that a, a father wouldn't be able to tell his daughter unlike the Bible the Old Testament the New Testament the Vedas a lot of those books have kind of sordid details of, of particular acts or they have words and things like that and the Quran doesn't. I was wondering, kind of, do you know why that specific intent is there? That 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 this, the the clarity of the language is such that it doesn't allow a young girl to feel embarrassed discussing something like that with her father. That there is that separation. And then who does she turn to if she has questions about that? I think I got it, and I'm yeah. going to try and answer it. And again, if I'm wrong, please forgive me. Yeah. I'm just looking back at the the time of when Islam came, baby girls were buried, yeah? They, was, they were just alive, they were put into holes and covered up. Um, they were sold as slaves, they were beaten, they were dishonoured, they were basically down here, yeah? And I often look at that time and, and when I start reading about Islam, what it gave to women and 
it was forbidden to bury your baby your baby girls because obviously you know you should be raising them with love and to educate them it gives a father on is it so there's a narration about two daughters yeah about having two daughters the blessings that is given upon the man how she should be protected as a wife prophet muhammad peace be upon him there is a narration for every aspect of life yeah and he was also very very vocal in how the female should be protected and if you want to look up the only surviving children that he had was females his sons died and to me that was a very big indication yeah of how his example should be with him only having girls and daughters and how he raised them and how he chose good partners good husbands for them you know he encouraged them in education he encouraged them to teach sh sharia there was none of this or oh, you have to go and run in a room and hide away their honor to protect themselves in terms of the modesty and to cover themselves up it, it it's honorable yeah modesty is honorable even though it's, it's when you look at this day and age it goes in way i mean the last time I think I, I went to church, no disrespect to the church, my mum is the Church of England and my dad was Catholic and I was brought up with both of those faiths and I understand them and I respect them both and they are people of the book. But the, the last time I went into a church, because of how I was brought up and how you respect the church and how you're going to God, the amount of flesh that was exposed, I was absolutely shocked and that was me speaking as the Church of England. Because you know that that was my upbringing. My mother gave me my my first introductions to faith. What her what she instilled in me as a child was God. Yeah. So my first teacher was my mother. Yeah. So I was I was really shocked because Christianity is very big on modesty. Yeah. And I couldn't understand. I'm not putting it down, I just can't understand it. If somebody wants to explain to me why that is acceptable now in a house of God, in any house of God, then please tell me. Because even Jesus, please be upon him, in Christianity also honoured women. One in Christianity, when Jesus was resurrected, who was the first person he appeared to? Mary Magdalene. Yeah? It was, it, he went to a woman first hand, and that's in Christianity, and there was lots of influential women in, in Christianity as well, who spread Christianity. And I'm trying to bring some comparison, that maybe Christianity does have, and some Bible, the Bible does have some questionable verses. We could say the same about the Quran, but each thing that was revealed, it's the same with the, with the Bible, was... You have to understand the era and what was going on at the same time, the same way that we ask. We should understand the era of what was going on in the Quran when people were saying that you can go and kill them. There were specific reasons, yeah? yeah? So coming back to it, yes, we should be honoured. It's a continuation and I love, one of the things I love about Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, and when I first started researching on Islam, <coughs> was how the woman was honoured. And I can remember sitting in Margaret's house. Where's she gone? Is she like this? All oh, right, okay. Because um, I'd never thought about it before and how the music industry, advertising industry, and basically anything to do with, with money will have a skank skankly clad woman selling that product. Yeah. And I never thought about that before because to me, that was normal, yeah? Seeing a woman draped over a car, Mercedes, like up, you know? <laughs> On a motorbike. I never, ever, ever sort of like understood that that was by men. We're using women, sticking them in bikinis, mini skirts, everything else to sell their product. And I was like, wow, this is interesting. I need to go look a bit further into the to women in Islam. Do you remember we were talking about the, in your house? Yeah. 
And then that was one of my very first sort of like introductions to Islam when I was researching it before I was a monthly, so I like Edmund and so on. So yeah, did I answer your question? I've offered on there. It all starts, I think, with the origin of sin. Yeah, the Eve Islam, to blame. The origin of the, the woman, there's not one place in the Quran where the finger of blame is pointed at Eve. In fact, both of them ate from the tree, and Satan is the one who pushed them. And being pregnant or having, it's not a punishment for the woman in Islam, it's a way of getting lots of, lots of rewards. Whereas in the Bible, I don't want to be comparing it, but there is the original sin, so maybe that's why uh, the, the yeah. finger of blame is pointed at me. I, I like that as well. In Islam, no, it's not a tool, and the woman is not a cause. Or making Adam or both of them yeah. coming back from her yeah. life. Yeah. I can see, remember sat in Sunday school yes. and being told about Eve, like it was her fault that she led man to sin. I was like, why? What did we do? <laughs> Not eat apple, chill out. <laughs> but <laughs> well, don't you think a lot is to do with interpretation? Yeah, I do. And who's interpreting it? Because I feel as though it's really interesting that we share so many. Yeah original stories, yeah. but who interprets them, and who preaches about them, and what slant they put on them, can vary, and it depends on who's in power as well. Exactly, yeah. Like. And, um, you know, I'm not a practicing Christian now, but uh, my view has changed in that, you know, that, that's true, the way it was put about that, about in fact, I, I just, the last time I went to church, almost, it was Mother's Day, and I took my mother to church, and I was very shocked that the sermon was not about mother, mother's role in bringing up a family, it was about woman as temperance, so afterward, I, I stayed behind to challenge the preacher on this, and I said, hey, we have a, a congregation here of mainly women in their 70s and 80s come to hear something nice on Mother's Day, and this is what you're telling them. So, it's, you know, a lot is about interpretation, isn't it? Yeah. Can I just have you, you struck a chord with me about dignity, and I'm frankly appalled at women in athletics are in skimpy little drawers, all the stomach showing, and then if they have a tumble, the cameras are there, this doesn't happen to men. Men wear shorts and a top, and maybe their arms are covered up. I really think we've got to say to our girls, time and place for everything. You yeah. have your private life, you have your social life, but don't go out looking so vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It really yeah, hurts. It was the, well, the other night, I was, in, I was coming home from my daughter, mm -hmm. and I was in Market Street getting the tram. Um, these girls were standing behind me and um, somebody, somebody was staring at this group of girls and had a male with them and these girls kicked up at these, this man and this man, this boy with them, this teenage boy, they're all teenagers and they were wearing what girls now wear, very young short and the dangly, uh, the glowy things around the neck. And this, these two girls went for, verbally went for this man. And the young man with them, he decided to become the macho <coughs> beautiful and drag his knuckles along the, um, the ground and then take it out on the, on the board of, 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 <coughs> of the metro station and then it caused a big scene when if, if they had just lowered the tempers lowered the hormone levels and just ignored him nothing would have happened because he walked away has anybody of it what's he Yearly festival called that he's a is it he's a park? Um park, 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 park. That's the park. one. I went through the town with my daughter when they were all going for the buses. I was absolutely horrified, I'm covering her eyes. She's only seven, yeah. But even I was shocked. Because one of the 
don't get me wrong, I'm no prude. I wasn't always Muslim. I used to do the nightclubs, yeah? We used to dress quite still modestly, but yeah. And um, one of the things, again, that Islam gave me was to respect my body. Because I think we're in an era where the more you flaunt, the more attention you get. But really, it should be the less that you show. The attention should be because of this and because of this, not because of these or the legs or this. That's the easiest way that I can put it. Yeah. I mean, today's clothes makes a six, the swinging sixties look positively fruity. Isn't that? Again and again, out with my granddaughter, went to the print work cinema, and there was this young girl. Wouldn't I swear she was fifteen? Take the makeup off. She was probably fourteen. Yeah. <laughs> And she had a see-through lace red dress on, up to here, with a thong, and I was like this with my granddaughter that I used to walk through, <laughs> because I don't want her getting any ideas, I've got to do my bit for protecting my baby. <laughs> but yeah, did I answer your question? We went completely how wonderful women are and why we're protecting. Well, you are wonderful, that's true. Yeah. Can I ask a little bit about leadership? Uh, within the mosque and the Muslim community. Um, so you, you, you gave an example of someone who was a Sharia judge. And I know Professor Mona Siddiqui is a theologian and she mm -hmm. writes books about Islam. Uh, how, how much do you think women are actually pushing the boundaries to see a, a different way of I spreading faith? <laughs> But studying and really uh, being prominent within the community from a women's perspective, I think that's what I'm asking. I think more can be done. I, can, I honestly do. Um, there are mosques which are predominantly men. Um, even here, I would say the Sharif part is, is men. Yeah. Um, maybe Sister Zaina could um, come in on this side as well. But, Fatima teaches, is one of the Quran teachers here. Um, she's very active, so she's teaching it, and will cover various aspects of Islam and, and the law and hadith. Yeah, and there's quite a lot of, there is quite a lot of women, compared to some of the mosques in Manchester, there is a lot of active women, but in terms of big roles, like trustees and management and judges, in Manchester, um, maybe Zayda can answer that one. <laughs> I only know this brief. <laughs> in most most that don't allow women to come mm. in, that's not allowed in Islam. Because if you go to Mecca and Medina, there is a special area for women. So there should be an area for women in all mosques. This is not following Islam properly. Because you have also people who have deviated from the middle part of Islam. Um, and women, uh, even at the time of Omar the Khalifa, there was a superintendent of the marketplace who was in charge of that. There were women in, you know, but due to that... Sorry, role, Shifa. Our Shifa yes, was, was part women of... Women were in many yeah. prominent positions. But because they have their role in, 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 you know, their primary role in a Muslim household, the primary role for the woman is her family. And the primary role for the man is working and earning the living. They both have complementary roles. We're not saying one is better than the other. Like the hand is not better than the eye, we need them both. So they have complete. So, so sometimes the woman, when she has free time, she can do all the other things. But that's her primary role because someone needs to do that. And she has the best psychological and abilities that God gave her to be able to do that. A man put him with a child for a few minutes or a few hours and he would say, no, that's it. But with all the good talk of, you know, men being, you know, uh, doing... I think there was multitasking. We better have multitasking. Do you all agree with me? No. <laughs> I, I think what I was, what I was trying to get to was that there are roles. It's an excuse yes, we use. Men, men and women. They complement each other. They complement each other. But, but I was actually thinking more about the spiritual side. Yeah. And, and development of faith. 
and understanding of religion and, and the women's role in, in that. And, and are, are there things that men should be learning from women? Yeah. yeah. Faith yes. and how you express yourself. If so, what would they be? Actually, That's there my were question. many women scholars, and nowadays mostly women are learning. upon prayer, you, you know, you're focusing upon Allah, that is going to take your mind to something else. It's, it's human nature. She's leading the man because she's at the back. No, no, that does not mean that. It is a modest yeah. uh, question of modesty. So the man is in front and the pros of the man. And in fact, going to the mosque is obligatory for the man. Just to add a point to the women. It's optional for the woman. They can come because they... It's really difficult to come five times a day and pray when it's raining, snowing, in the morning, early morning. So she comes when she wants to. Because she has to men's choice of, um, of employment very much. Uh, having the, the time to ah, okay. day. Yes. No, right. no. How long does it they take? Don't, they, they can pray at the place of work. <laughs> they can pray at their place. If there's a mosque nearby, yeah. the, the important the one is like a Friday mm -hmm. prayer, uh, which is a long time, mm -hmm. and maybe early morning and then the night. Mm -hmm. If they can in the day, they can. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to say, as a, as a nursery teacher, I've worked with quite a lot of men who have been great nursery teachers. Yes, that's true. No, no, they, it's true. They can do the roles. I mean, they, can, they complement each other. I'm not saying God is better. But uh, the abilities that, you know. Can I just make a point on that? I think sometimes people misconstrue what leadership actually is. That it's, it's an, a place of authority or dignity. Whereas it's anything but that. And so in Islam, the idea of leadership is very different to that that's given in kind of leadership speak as we talk about in management now. So leadership is something that people push away because they're fearful of the responsibility that comes with it because of how dire the decisions that someone can make for something can be, especially in an organization like a masjid where if you're making decisions about the safety and security of the children who come to the masjid, how do you decide what age groups are permitted, what groups aren't permitted? How do you decide kind of the employees you keep and those kinds of responsibilities? Those kinds of responsibilities are huge. They're full-time responsibilities. Um, and that's why kind of I personally think that if there was a family living in this masjid and they were had like a kind of a responsibility to look after it, they could they couldn't do it as a family unit. Because there's so many communication and logistical responsibilities that exist. If a woman comes along and she can do that job better than a man, then there's absolutely no reason why 
she should be discriminated about because she's a woman. Uh, there's absolutely no reason why that would happen. And if there was any obstacle to that because of discrimination, it's the discrimination that needs to be addressed. So for example, if there was an excuse that a woman might get abused by a man coming to the mosque, like some of the managers here sometimes do when they have to make difficult decisions, then that's not the problem of the woman, that's the problem of the person who's making the abuse. Yeah. And so that's why kind of Islamically there's a big difference between what is responsibility and leadership and how to get there, that's number one. And then number two is kind of the, the dignity of the person who holds that. When it comes to religious matters, as Sister Zayna said, there's a few places where men are specifically chosen and we don't we, we accept those because that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator, has decided. He made Adam first, he made uh, kind of the prophets all male, he gave the women such amazing responsibilities within those stories of each of those prophets, but at the same time, they, they didn't have prophethood. And we accept that from Allah. But we taught it well. <laughs> back at the presentation, we taught it well. Just to add another point of, I don't always like pointing things about men that the women can't pray in front of men because she's bent over and it's to stop their minds from going. The same applies to women, yeah, because we're just as human and, and we just have the same desires as everybody else. So when they used, the women used to pray behind the, the, the men, they were supposed to wait a couple of seconds to come out of subdued so the men could come out first because of the way that they were bent over as well. And one historical account was that men didn't wear the undergarments as they do today as well. So it was to stop them from their eyes from seeing things that they shouldn't have seen to keep them off the prep, to stop them focusing upon the prayer. So desire is a two-way thing, and I just don't want to fit, I just don't want men to think, oh you women are always blaming men, like you're the ones who are always doing things wrong, because it's not women are just can be equally. <laughs> As bad. And as soon as the International Women's Day is about equality, we're going to have to met, bring that in because it is an actual true fact. Mm. Women do get the facts. I, I believe women are far more yes. vocal when we're together in discussing a few things than you men are. So <laughs> be aware you are discussed. <laughs> Anything else? Did it answer Did it, yeah, sorry, did it answer your question? I, I, I think what we don't really, so I think... No, I, I think from a, from a Christian point of view, which is my yeah. tradition, um, it's, it's, it, it feels sometimes as if Islam is just given, and you just have to accept everything that's in it. A bit like uh, God, God only sent male prophets, you, you know. Um, and, and, and what we try to do, I think, is to uh, enable people to reflect theologically on their own experience and try and understand in relation to God and each other what it is that God wants us to do. That now that's quite a complicated process. And I just wonder if there were women who were leading that sort of discussion within the mosque, or whether men don't do it either. I'm going to answer from my perspective in what you said about reflecting. Remember I was Church of England, went to Sunday school, and that same ritual thing was there. Every Sunday you went to Sunday school. You didn't get to question anything, anything that you learned on that board was actually incorrect, yeah? When I found out that Jesus wasn't... Well, it was an interpretation. Yeah, it was an interpretation. It, it just, it's the same way it's being taught, the same as Islam is taught to children, Christianity and Judaism do, do the same. They have, they have schools where they go to. So only when you get to a certain age can you start reasoning things and then looking at the divine, your, the creation, your place in the world. And that's what I did. Yeah? As a Christian, as the Church of England, that's what I did. I questioned my surrounding. I went to Islam. That was... That was where I found my happiness, my peace, my understanding of what it was about. Because when I looked at Christianity, you know, you find out that, that Jesus wasn't actually born on Christmas Day and the priests from St. Paul, St. Anne's, St. Anne's, Church and St. 
Church and Sand. Yeah, so yeah. Sands. Actually Petite. admitted that it was true. I felt extremely upset that as a child, yeah, I was told that Jesus Christ was born on Christmas Day and we had to go to church before we was allowed to open our presents. And it was equally soul destroying as finding out that your dad was actually found on Christmas. Yeah, and catching him coming out of the bedroom with presents. Because it's a lie that children are taught. And it shouldn't be it should be an honest conversation with children and you shouldn't try and bring in something that is it's false. To me it's false. The, Christ, the Christian faith admitted. You know, and it, and it was those and I'm not putting it down. I have if but this is it was celebrated it's fine. It's just the day. Okay, but that's I know it's a day. Yeah. But it's the day that we need to That's what I'm saying, it was, that yes, was, that 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 was, I've been outside um, at help my house, we've gone to other people's houses, we've gone to various other Islamic institutions, and we will have those talks about spirituality and, and how that feels and, and what it is about. I can pinpoint the actual day when my spirituality opened, what it was I didn't know. I knew God was there, who was he? I hadn't a clue on that day, I didn't know, yeah? But I knew that God was there, whoever he was, yeah? And I had to go and find him. Does that make sense? So I, yes, questioned, that's fine. Yeah. I questioned my existence in a world that surrounded me and what I believed at that time to be everything real in, at 28 years old. But it's probably the same God, in fact. It is the same God. <laughs> yeah. It is the same God. There's no, it's, Sometimes the media refers to Allah as being a different God, or people think Allah is a good, different God. It's not even some of the Christians will use Allah in the Middle East. Yeah? Some even say Allah, God is great. Yeah, so. And they'll just use the. the like, um, they say, it's Allah, but they don't use the house. There are many rooms. Um, and, you know, it's just a different room. It's just, yeah. you know, it's, it's got different curtains. I always exactly to, because I, I grew up as an Anglo Catholic. My father was a, a Methodist lay preacher. My mother was Low Church of England. I wouldn't recognise her church service if I fell over it. Actually, Margaret was connected to this church, but as it was a Methodist church. This, I, I, I grew up with the church. Yeah? So, for a nice 
task, and I want you brothers to write a few things as well. There is a board, a message for my sister, and I want everybody to write one positive message that you would want to say to your sister, including your Christian sister, if you want to, your Jewish sister, your Muslim sister, but she's a woman, and women are sisters, and we need to lift, we need to be in a world where we lift each other up and support each other instead of putting each other down, yeah? So please, go to the table, write your message, I'm going to put them on the board, and I'm going to put them in the sisters area later on. I want you men, if you would, what you would want to say to a sister, you can write several, <laughs> yeah? Please go and write your messages and we can put this board together. So I'm going to end it there and give you the time to do this, but if any questions, quickly, yeah. Sorry? Can I go? Of course you can. Be the first woman. See? She's up, she's going. Okay. So thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed like, the interactive. It was my very first presentation. So thank you. Thank you. Well, <laughs> I'm all shy now. Huh? You don't see me shy often. <laughs> Is it okay? Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. Can anyone Muslim or Muslim? Huh? She's a friend of mine. She's a friend of mine.